What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here coming at you guys with another episode in our SEC and 30 Days thing we got going on this month. We are joined by a Missouri football insider for PowerMizzou.com, part of the Rival Sports Network, one of the best networks out there. So make sure to check out uh, Rivals and all those sites they have out there. But Mitchell Forty is joining us today, and I just want to say I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Absolutely, Zach. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So we got to start with the 2020 season. A lot of people were predicting Missouri to win like a game, just a single game, maybe two. They pull out a five and five record, big wins over defending national champion LSU, Kentucky, even Arkansas, who showed major improvement this season. Sadly, ended the season with a canceled bowl game. I was really looking forward to seeing Mizzou against Iowa. That would have been an awesome battle in the Midwest there. So they end off with the season loss to Mississippi State, sadly. But did this season for you, in terms of on-the-field performance, meet, exceed, or fall short of your preseason expectations? Definitely exceeded. Um, I, I was one of those who was picking them to win two, maybe three games. And, and you know, I mean, one, uh, you know, that they went through a head coaching change, and, and Eli Drinkwitz and his staff didn't get very much time to, you know, gel with their new team because of a pandemic. They had to replace the starting quarterback. And, um, you know, when you looked when when you, you looked at the new schedule and they drew Alabama and LSU out of the West, I think all of us just kind of assumed those would be two losses. Obviously, LSU ended up being a little bit worse, well, a lot worse than, than expectations. But still, I, I thought it was a solid year for Missouri. I mean, you know, certainly looking back at almost you almost part of you want to say it could have been better um, just because they did end up losing to Tennessee and Mississippi State. But at the same time, Given all that they had to deal with, I think it, it was definitely a, a really good first step for Eli Drinkwitz and his staff. Absolutely. And, I mean, you know, Eli Drinkwitz is an offensive guy, but the Missouri defense was one that had, I think, a lot of the star players. You look at someone like Nick Bolton at going to the NFL draft. He was one of my top linebackers coming out of the SEC this year. But it really lacked the ability to make key stops in big games. I feel like there was a few games where they get a stop here or there. That game is probably a win for Missouri. They bring in Steve Wilkes over 14 years of NFL experience, multiple Super Bowl appearances on multiple staffs. What are, what are your expectations for this Missouri defense moving forward? And what are some what are like the biggest fundamental changes that you think that you need to see from this defense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be totally honest. I don't know really what to expect. Um, you know, not only did you, as you mentioned, are they replacing Ryan Walters with Steve Wilkes as defensive coordinator, bringing in a new cornerbacks coach and a new defensive line coach. And they lost a lot from that defense last year. You know, you mentioned Nick Bolton, second round pick. He was an all SEC guy. They had a couple other guys in, in Josh Bledsoe and Tyree Gillespie who were three year starters at safety, um, lost a starting cornerback to the transfer portal. So, you know, they've got a lot to replace in that defense. And, uh, you know, Steve Wilkes, you know, you hear him talk. He talked about doing a little more zone coverage. Ryan Walters was very much, you know, press man all the time. Um, so, you know, trying to, trying to you know, kind of eliminate the, the, uh, deep, the deep shots opponents can convert and maybe get some more turnovers by playing some zone. But we'll see what that actually looks like in practice. Um, I, I, I think the front of this defense could, be, could still be okay. They bring back a lot on the defensive line, including Trajan Jeffcoat, who was an all SEC guy. I think he had six sacks last season. Um, you know, and and the linebackers, even though they lose Nick Bolton, they they have a guy coming in from Rice Blaze Aldridge, who was a um a hundred plus tackle guy each of the past two seasons. But I think the secondary is a big question mark for me. Mentioned, you know, losing two starting safeties and a starting corner, that's gonna be tough to replace. So we'll see uh see what happens there. Absolutely. But I mean, you look at let's I want to move to the head coaching spot. First season for Eli Drinkowicz, new head coach from Missouri, came from Appalachian State where he won the Sun Belt his first year, 12-1 and record there. Big win over SEC South Carolina, who he played again this year. Um, also stops at Boise State, NC State as the offensive coordinator. Why was Drinkowicz the guy for Missouri, and what are your expectations for him over these next few years? Well, it was a really interesting coaching search. Um, you know, when, when they moved on from Barry Odom, Basically, uh, at one point, you know, we were told and stand by this, that the, the search committee came back and Jim, gave Jim Sterk, you know, they, they did their diligence. And Jim Sterk came to the board of curators with three names, uh, Brian Anderson from uh, Arkansas State, 
um, Willie Fritz and Jeff Munkin. And basically they said, you know, I think we can do better. Keep looking. And uh, depends on whose start, side of the story you believe, whether or not they said, here's more money to, to do better or just do better. But regardless, um, Eli Drinkwitz was coaching in the Sun Belt Championship game that following weekend. Um, Appalachian State won, and then Missouri uh, got him on a plane. Or the, the Curries actually flew out there, did an interview with him, and then got him on a plane shortly thereafter, brought him to Missouri. Um, I think what really captivated, you know, Sterk and, and the, the search committee was a he's really young and he's really energetic, and you know he's he's the type of guy who you know he he seems to have the energy to do to to do you know kind of a job that's going to take a few years to to get Missouri up and running. I mean, it, this wasn't the type of place you roll in like in Auburn and. You know, can if you do everything right, you can get them competitive in a year or two. I mean, it's going to be a little bit of a grind. Um, he's an offensive guy, as you mentioned. That's just kind of been a trend in coaching as a whole. But also, when you're following Barry Odom, who's a defensive guy, I think the natural tendency is to go offense. Um, and, and he's he really has – I mean, he's succeeded everywhere he's gone. He's had a very, very fast rise through the coaching ranks. Kind of a non-traditional resume. He never played college football. Um, he was studying to become a lawyer when he decided he wanted to be a, a football coach. And he went, it took him, let's see, 13 years, I think, from being a grad assistant at Auburn to suddenly being the head coach at Appalachian State. And then, you know, one more year to being the head coach at Missouri. So a very fast rise. And I think a lot of it has to do with just kind of his energy and his personality. Right. Yeah, he's one of my favorite coaches and he didn't waste any time being like outspoken about multiple college football issues. I believe he was one of the main people cited in like the recent tampering article that ESPN just released. So n there's no, uh, there's like no shyness in Eli, but the, the key to rebuilding a program you mentioned is recruiting a top 30 class for the first class in the Drinkowich era headlined by, you mentioned corner was a big need. They got the number five Juco corner Jadarius Perkins coming to campus, but what were the biggest positional needs for Missouri in this class? And do you see any instant impact guys that are coming to campus with this class? Yeah, real quick. You mentioned Drinkwitz not being shy. I, I can guarantee you he's going to be one of the, uh, one of the biggest draws at SEC media days this, this coming uh, next month. He's, he's very, very, uh, he likes to talk. He likes the big stage, <laughs> but um, yeah. So interesting. You mentioned Perkins. He actually had wild recruitment there. Um, you know, Basically didn't even announce a commitment until after he had already enrolled in Missouri, went through spring ball, and now is uh, transferring again. He's actually headed to Florida. Oh, wow. So he will not be at Missouri this fall, which just Gosh. kind of further compounds the needs in the secondary <laughs> there. Um, for the most part, a, a really big focus of this class for Missouri was the defensive line. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to, you know, turn out a bunch of contributors this year because um, they had a lot of guys coming back or use that, that extra year of eligibility to come back. Um, but, you know, usually in recruiting, you're not recruiting for the immediate future. It's more, you know, a year or two down the line. And they had some some class balance issues there in the D-line. They, they signed, I think, seven or eight guys there. And a few few guys who are very, very highly touted. I mentioned Blaze Aldridge, the linebacker from uh, from Rice. He's a guy who I think will almost certainly start. He'll play a lot this season. And then the other big transfer who Missouri fans are really excited for is Mookie Cooper, a wide receiver from Ohio State. He was a a uh, high four, some five star by some some sites uh, coming out of St. the St. Louis area. Went to Ohio State, uh, didn't play at all as a true freshman, and uh, still has all four years of eligibility left and is coming to Missouri. And obviously, with the new transfer rule, he'll be able to play right away. So he's he's a small guy, but he's very fast uh, by all accounts. Very speedy, can help in the return game as well. So uh, Missouri fans will be interested to see what he can do this year. Absolutely, and I mean. You know, the, the spring game wrapped up spring practices back on the 20th of March. Really the first spring practice spring game for Eli Drinkowicz. We saw COVID last year wipe out everything for everybody. So this was a real big, you know, storyline and test for him. What were, what were like the biggest positional storylines, player storylines you were watching? And what were your overall final takeaways from the spring practice period? Yeah, you know, spring football is always – it's interesting because, uh, you know, you love the chance to be able to see a little bit of the team and, and talk to some players again. But I try not to put too, too much stock in it. I mean, you know, we were only there for about 45 minutes worth of each practice. There were one or two that we got to watch the whole thing. But, we you know, we would basically watch stretches and drills. That was about it. But, uh, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was curious to see, you know, obviously the newcomers, always something you look at. 
Um, you know, the offensive line, they're replacing a, a few different guys there, a couple starters there. Um, so, so looked at that. But I really, for me, like I said earlier, it's the defense for me that has my fascination this year. You know, not only are you replacing guys, but, the, you know, new coordinator, new scheme. Um, and, and we got to see, you know, very vanilla aspects of it. Um, like I said, a little more zone coverage. You, you could tell that. Um, but, you know, that, that was certainly the thing that, that I was watching the most, especially the back seven, just trying to get a feel for who's going to be, uh, you know, the guys back there. There's, they've got a lot of youth, um, especially at corner. So um, I think you'll see, you know, a lot of probably a couple of guys who are technically freshmen, although they played last year in the pandemic year, who will be starters there. Um, and, and that'll still be something that we're really watching as we get into fall camp and even the season starting. Right. And I mean, you mentioned Drickwich being an offensive guy. He was an offensive coordinator and QB coach at most of his stops. Real talented offensive mind. He gets a lot of people back in terms of offensive talent, in terms of skill positions, court like working with the quarterbacks and things like that. Kind of what is the how 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 much do you think he's gonna help the development of a guy like a Connor uh Blazelake or you know and some of the wide receivers that you see Missouri returning? Like kind of what are what are the offensive expectations for this team who showed us, especially against LSU, that they can go up and put up almost 50 points a game if needed? Yeah. Um, you know, I really I'm very interested to see what what kind of development Connor Blazelake can have. And I, I think the potential is there for him to have a really good season. Um, you know, he he was a redshirt freshman last season. So in, in his first year as a true freshman, he played in like two games and he started the last game of the season. He tore out, he tore his ACL, he blew out his knee in the first quarter. So he barely played at all. Then of course, you know, he's rehabbing during the off season, then COVID happened. So he really didn't get a chance to practice at all until fall camp. Um, and, and then ended up winning the starting job midway through the season and playing pretty well. I, I have to imagine that, you know, with a full year in the off season and with, you know, a set, head coach who's also the quarterback's coach, able to develop him, you know, th there is definitely some hope and expectation that he can make a, a significant stride this year. He was fine last season. He was very accurate. He took care of the ball pretty well. He was not very dynamic when it came to throwing the ball downfield, um, you know, just not a lot of deep completions. And I think that's an area that obviously, you know, you want to be able to have that dynamic in your offense and, and an area where, you know, Eli Drinkwitz would like to see the offense improve. He said that multiple times during the spring. So if Connor Bazelak can take that step and, you know, certainly helpful was bringing in some speed. Like I mentioned, Mookie Cooper, they also brought in a four-star receiver named Dominic Lovett from the St. Louis area, who's widely regarded as kind of a burner deep threat type of guy. So, you know, but with those two things combined, if Missouri can, can improve the deep passing game, that would, that should help the offense as a whole. Absolutely. So, you know, I want to shift to, you know, the, the next season again, I mean, which players, I mean, we see it every year. There's players that just come out of the woodworks and you're like, I don't know how he had this breakout season. Who, who do you have your eyes on as kind of like the breakout prospects for this 2021 Missouri team? Yeah, I think Tyler Beatty is definitely a name to watch. He's a running back who who's he's played quite a bit, but he's never been the guy. Um, Larry Roundtree at Missouri was just such a workhorse last year. You know, they would ride him 20, 30, 35 carries a game that Beatty just was kind of, you know, relegated to that third down work, change of pace. He's a really good receiver. Um, and they, they still may, you know, have another guy kind of work as, you know, some some more of a between the tackles runner this season. But I think Beatty will certainly have a larger role. And I think he could do some good things with it. He is small. He has to stand up to the, to the you know, to the to the hits. He's probably about five, six. But I think he uh, I think he could really have a big season. Um, you know, he, like I mentioned, really good receiver out of the backfield. Um, and then on the defensive side, you know, Kobe Whiteside's a name who he, he was actually preseason all SEC entering last year. So I don't know if he's totally out of the woodwork, but he uh, had a couple different injuries and um, ended up not only playing like two games um, defensive tackle. I think he's a guy he had seven sacks a couple seasons ago. I think he's a guy who could, uh, who could have a good season. Yeah. I mean, so given all that, I mean, you look at the schedule, it's the SEC. It's always going to be just one of the toughest schedules in the country. But then you also compound it with having a road trip to Boston College for the out-of-conference. It's always going to be a tough game. They showed a lot of fight last year, almost knocking off Clemson. And they also have road trips to Kentucky and Georgia, which are tough. And then you still have Florida and A&M coming into Missouri, who are both probably going to be top 10 teams preseason. What is the ceiling and or floor for this 2021 team, in your opinion, as we sit here in June? 
Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely a pretty wide range there. There's a lot of swing games. Um, I, I, you know, as I look at it, you've got three games that, that you should definitely win and probably four, um, you know, the, the non-conference games, not counting Boston college. I think it's like central Michigan, Southeast Missouri, and uh, someone else bad. I don't remember. And, uh, and then Vanderbilt, you should probably win those four games. Um, and then, um, you know, you're probably going to lose to Georgia, Texas A&M, and Florida. There, there's a chance, you know, maybe Florida takes a step back. They're coming to Missouri. You know, there's a chance. But, but you know, I'd say that the, the floor is probably four and eight, and the ceiling is probably nine and three, realistically. And then it's just, you know, there, it, it comes – every year it comes down to those swing games within the SEC, you know, South Carolina, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky – those are all teams that if you can just beat each other, you can be the third best team in the SEC East in a given year. But that's obviously easier said than done. And you mentioned the trip to Boston College. That's a, that's going to be a tough early season test. I'm intrigued for that game, too. They're obviously bringing back quite a bit. Um, and, and, you know, anytime you've got a true road game early in the season, non-conference, that'll be an interesting test. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Boston College has been – for me, at least on the upswing for the past few years. But, you know, these last two questions are more about Missouri itself. I mean, you saw Missouri make the jump to the SEC, proceed to make multiple SEC championship runs. I mean, got to the game. They lost Auburn in 13, lost to Alabama. Um, for, for you, what is kind of like the tone of the fan base? I mean, well, what – like you've been covering the team. What needs to be done to get Missouri back to that point? where they're competing for SEC titles rather than you mentioned third and just the East. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, the fan base is really optimistic right now. Um, you know, Drinkwitz has really, he, he has come in and infused a lot of energy. He, like I said, really, really personable guy. Anytime you hear him talk, he'll walk away amused and excited. Um, and he's recruited really well. I mean, they, you know, they, they finished with the number 20 class, according to rivals uh, last season and in, in, you know, a year where he basically never got to meet a lot of these guys in person. Um, so people are excited, but at the same time, I think, you know, I'm sure there's some fans who are talking about winning the SECs this year, but I think most rational fans understand this is going to be, like I said earlier, it's a multi-year process to try to get this thing turned around. Um, and especially when you've got Georgia, you know, just at the level that it is right now. Um, so, you know, I think what it, what it's going to take is it's going to take stacking several good classes on top of each other, probably, you know, three, four, five really good recruiting classes on top of each other, getting, you know, a, a team full of his guys and being able to develop, you know, a, a you know, a class of, of juniors and seniors that really sticks together. And, you know, maybe something breaks right where, you know, it, I think the goal for Missouri is you're always up there, you know, third in the SEC East, like I said, able to consistently kind of beat those South Carolinas, Kentucky's, Tennessee's. But if, if, you know, once every four or five years, everything breaks right where Georgia and Florida have it down here, or, you know, the one that's good, you catch them, uh, you know, you catch them in Columbia, um, you can compete for that division title. So I think it's not something that you're looking at happening every year. And, and I could be wrong, but I think realistically what, what Gary Pinkle showed as the blueprint is contend, be at the top half of the division every year. And, and once, you know, about every, every four or five years, you're able to kind of break through. Right. I mean, there was a time where, I mean, I remember when I was like younger, when Missouri was still in the big 12, I mean, they were that 07 season was just unbelievable. So, I mean, it, it can be done. Missouri has been at the top of the top, but I haven't been able to make a game. I've been to Columbia. It was just not football season, sadly. And I, I really want to go to a game. I'm at, I'm at Kansas. I'm at Kansas state now. So it's right there. Mm -hmm. I need to make a trip over, but what makes Columbia, memorial stadium such a unique environment on game days yeah i mean it's you know it, it's a cool place to watch a game it's not i'm not going to pretend like it's you know i mean there's anything it has that you know anywhere else in the sec doesn't have but it's a cool college town you know obviously you know game days everything revolves around the game everyone's going to the game um campus is nice um you know, as for the stadium itself, there's the the, the kind of hill and rock M in the north end zone is sort of the signature aspect. Um, and then they just renovated and, and redid the whole south end zone. And it's it's a really nice facility. I will say, you know, there's um, luxury seating. There's a, a, a ground area called the Bunker Club that anyone who has tickets in that whole um, seats in that whole south end zone can go down to. And it's like a, um, you know, field level bar that the players walk through before games. Um, and then behind that is all of the the football field or football teams facilities, weight room, you know, recovery room, locker room, all of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's a, it's a it's a decent place to come watch a game. I uh, I recommend it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's not. I'm not going to say sit here and say it's like you know got anything that that probably like a Auburn or Alabama or something doesn't. 
Right. It's always an arms race, man. I mean, the, the yeah. amount of money that people are putting into stadiums and facilities is getting kind of outrageous. I mean, the one Auburn's building now is the price tag on that is way more than I ever thought we'd ever. It's like 90 million or something like that. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. But, you know, last question here, man, you've been covering Missouri football, but just what is what is the coolest moment that you've got to experience covering Missouri sports? And, you know, what's that like one memory that kind of sticks out? Hmm, let's see. So I've been doing I've been doing this job covering Missouri sports since like February of 2018. Um, and I'm trying to think, I mean, you know, they, they, frankly, there's not been anything like, in, you know, they haven't won a division title or a conference title or anything in that time. So that's, that's kind of out. Um, you know, I'll give you one each for football and one for basketball. Basketball is probably the the top in that first season. I started covering them. That was the season that Conzo Martin's first season in Columbia, they had Michael Porter jr. Come in, obviously that didn't end up working out, but the, the fan atmosphere around that team was, was really something I hadn't seen. Cause I went to Missouri. So I hadn't seen that during my time at school, you know, it was, it was a bad basketball program. And so that season, uh, actually the first game I covered in this job, they beat, Kentucky for the first time in school history. It was a sold out crowd. That was a lot of fun. Just cool to see. Um, football is probably in, uh, I guess it would be 2019. They went to Florida and won um, in the swamp. And it was actually uh, the week before they had lost an absolute heartbreaker to Kentucky where Kentucky scored on an untimed down and then got the two point conversion to win. Um, and so people were, were definitely down on the process on the team and, uh, you know, Barry Odom and, and Drew Locke, that was his senior season. He went down to, they, they went down to Florida. He had a big game and it was, you know, kind of cathartic for him. You could see after the game, he was, he was emotional about it. So that was, that was cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I mean, just kind of a follow up. I'm interested to hear because, like, I'm way higher on Drew Locke than some people. Do you think he just gets a bad rap in the NFL? Do you think? Do you think the Broncos fans need to give him just like a little bit of leeway until they get some more talent around him? Because I feel like he has no offensive line or anything, and they're like, just get rid of him. We'll bring in this quarterback, and it's like until you get him some help, it's not ever going to work out. Yeah, so I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit in both camps. I can kind of split the difference there. I, I think, you know, I give him a little bit of a pass for last season because actually, so full disclosure, I'm a Broncos fan. I grew up a Broncos fan, so okay. I watched every game. The the Broncos were an injured mess last season. You know, I mean, offensive line injuries, receiver injuries like crazy. I mean, Cortland Sutton didn't even, you know, hardly play. Um, so, and obviously, you know, no, no, no real off season to speak of, which is, you know, beneficial for a quarterback who was playing for a new offensive coordinator. So I give him a little bit of a pass. That said, he's got to he's got to protect the ball better. Um, you know, that's just the number one thing in the NFL. You can't be turning the ball over what was some, like thirty times or something like that. Um, so he he's got to improve in that area, um, and I think he will. You know, I, I've always said I, I think he deserves this season to to be the starter, and and you know, assuming you know. So he's not nothing terrible happens in camp or whatever. I think he'll be the starter this season and, uh, you know, he'll get this chance to prove he's the guy and then, and then go from there. But it is a crazy world right now, man, in the NFL, you know, with, with all these young quarterbacks we've seen come in and play well right away, the clock is, you don't get a lot of leash. I mean, you've got to, you pretty much got to show it in the first year or two or else they're moving on. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm a Dolphins fan. So like we had Tua and he played mm -hmm. like six games and they're like, get him out of there we spit the fourth yeah. pick on him we don't even want him anymore i was like yeah that's crazy see that's that's <laughs> that's a little worse to me because like drew Locke, you know 41st pick or whatever it's not quite as much an investment like you take a guy in the top five you better be giving him a few years i think exactly i, I just feel like that justin herbert doing what he did was the worst mm -hmm. thing that could ever happen for tua because now all the dolphins fans are like well i guess that's who we should have taken instead yep. <laughs> instead of him but man i appreciate you jumping on the podcast with me man talking all things missouri football where can our listeners find you social media websites articles anything you want to plug now man this time is yours yeah so i'm on twitter at mitchell 4d it's the number four in the letter d at the end of my name and then powermazoo.com is the rep website like you mentioned it's part of the rivals network and we actually have a special going on right now so it's a subscription website but um you can sign up anytime here in the month of june and if you sign up before the end of the month of june you get uh until august 10th for free and then, you know, you start paying for the membership. So um, it's a great time to do it. We've got just an absolute ton of recruiting coverage going on right now. Obviously, recruiting's open again for the first time in about 15 months. So we're at all the camps, you know, talking to, to guys as they come on for official visits. Um, so, yeah, and then we'll carry that going coverage going right on into fall camp. So check it out. Uh, it's powermazoo.com. Absolutely, guys. Go do that. Rivals is one of the best sites out there, man. I, I have my subscription, so y'all need to get y'all's. But – Guys, make sure to go check out Mitchell and everything going on with Missouri football. 
Y'all know where to find us, YouTube, any and all podcast streaming platforms. Subscribe now. But we're going to continue our SEC in 30 days later this week with Vanderbilt. So make sure to check that one out as well. And you can check out our one from earlier this week, which we did Florida. So make sure to check out all these episodes together right here on YouTube. But guys, for Mitchell, for myself, and for the Blue Bloods, we are out.